Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of Falcon 2024 here at the ARIA in Las Vegas. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host and co-analyst, Dave Vellante. We've got a very good friend of theCUBE joining us for this segment, Sean Henry, Chief Security Officer here at CrowdStrike. Thank you so much for coming back on. Thank you for having me. This is just absolutely fantastic, and I love the opportunity always to talk to the two of you about what's happening in the world of cyber crime, cyber adversaries. Well, we're going to get into all of that. Uh, criminal nation states and uh, e-crime and the, our, the, elect, the integrity of our elections, we're going to get an all into that. But for our viewers who have not watched all of your highlights, tell us, you're one of the longest tenured executive leaders here at CrowdStrike. Um, tell us a little bit about your career. You retired from the FBI, joined CrowdStrike. I did. So I've, I spent 24 years at the FBI. I retired as executive assistant director. So I was running half of the FBI's operations globally. I left in 2012, I retired, and uh, came to CrowdStrike. When I got here, um, we had no products, we had no sales, no customers, but our CEO, uh, founder George Kurtz just had this vision and the idea and when he, I'd never met him before but he pitched me on what he wanted to do and um, I took a little bit of time to think about it and, and jumped over and I've been here ever since and it's just been a fantastic ride. I feel like we're really having a, an incredible impact, helping to protect critical infrastructure. We're, we're stopping bad guys on a regular basis, nation states, and it really for me, you know, when I was in the Bureau, it was about the mission and protecting good people from bad things. And this is just a natural transition into the private sector where we could have a, a really significant role in keeping people safe. That was a long shot bet you took personally because at the time, the, the business was, I mean, much more of a it mess than exist. it is now, right? It was an idea. Yeah. I, it was a huge risk. You know, for me, most of my colleagues were becoming chief security officers for major companies, so Disney, Caterpillar, Merck Pharmaceutical, uh, Citibank. Good job. All former <laughs> colleagues of mine who are CSOs, Chief Security Officers, and go into a startup. There were more than a couple of people who gave me a side eye, like, what are you doing? But I knew because I'd been running the cyber program in the Bureau, I knew what the risks were to, to infrastructure, what the threats were, and I knew that the government, while it was working very hard and continues to and is having successes, didn't have the capability to scale and protect the commercial sector globally. And I just saw that opportunity there, and George is just a visionary, and his idea was just the right idea about building this technology, the Falcon platform that we now have 12 years later, tens of thousands of customers, uh, but his idea was the right idea. So it was a huge risk, a, a leap, but I bet on him and his idea, and I had a good background on what the, the market would be. Yeah, well, congratulations on that. I went back into our AI video from our conversation last year, we looked at some of the highlights, and it was interesting, we were talking about the big four, Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea, and we also talked about, at the time there was one hot war in Ukraine, we're now two years in, we've got a hot war in the Middle East. What have you discerned in your research and your observations? What have you learned? How has that changed in the last 12, 15 months? So I don't know that there's been much change in our observations other than more validation, I mm -hmm. think. I think it's very clear if you look at Russia, Ukraine, and, and Israel and, and Palestine, what's happened there, that um, nation states are absolutely going to use cyber as a tool or a weapon in any type of physical conflict. It's absolutely going to be a component, and in many cases it's going to be a precursor to an actual physical invasion. The ability to impact communications, the ability to create havoc, uh, to knock out electric power, which can be done, all of that through cyber means, is a huge advantage for somebody who's going to subsequently launch a ground war. Um, and that's going to continue to happen in any conflict going forward. It, it's a natural component. Um, it used to be thought of, I think, as something that might have been aspirational, but I think it's been very clearly vetted out as a, a clear advantage and a, an opportunity that will not be missed. As somebody who's been inside the government and knows how it, how it operates, and of course, it's big. There's a lot of different governments inside the government. But I remember talking to Robert Gates, and I might have mentioned this to you, when I said, but don't we have in the United States the best cyber? Can't we go on the attack? And his response was, yes, but we have to be careful because we have a lot to lose. 
And when you think about the, the narrative that's going on with respect, for instance, the economic situation in China and tariffs and so forth, and the military component of that, the threat of hot wars, nuclear war, how does cyber fit into that? Because I, I think a lot of people think, well, you know, like Ben Franklin, trading partners seldom wage war. So let's do more trade, and we seem to be going in a different direction. The United States likes to be the world leader. We're number one, we're the big power. And so we use our military might, but now cyber comes into that equation. How do you think the United States should be using cyber to maintain its world presence? So that's a big question. Um, cyber is the great equalizer, and it's, it's a, an opportunity in an asymmetric world for those that might be less powerful from a military perspective to gain a significant advantage mm -hmm. because they can impact the military might, the infrastructure of large powers. So it's, well I call it the great equalizer, right? It's, it's kind of a, a magical tool in the belt of some of these smaller, less sophisticated governments or even those that might be sympathetic to the government, not necessarily working on behalf of the government, right? These hacktivist groups. So it's provided them a, a great opportunity. I think that the potential long-term impact from a prolonged um, cyber war, while certainly not a great, great a threat as a nuclear uh, event, has the ability to disrupt infrastructure, to physically destroy infrastructure, similar to what's been happening kinetically. The pipes, the routes, uh, the cap distribution capabilities, and that, ha that can have long-term implications and impact. So while, again, not really on par with nuclear, it is a, a major concern for civilized nations who, by the way, rely completely on that infrastructure to survive, right? If, if our internet was knocked out, our power was knocked out here for five days or more, people would start dying, right? If it was in the dead of winter or the heat of summer, we lost AC, we lost heat, um, you know, food supply, the whole supply chain we've seen with COVID, how that can be impacted and cyber's being used to disrupt those types of things. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I think nation states need to be thinking about what the blowback is, right? Living in glass houses, what the cascading impact is. And I think that there has to be a lot more discussion, nation state to nation state, about what the red lines are. And if you cross this line, this is what the result is going to be. Well, the reason I ask you know, is because it could be a path to nuclear war, that asymmetry, that's the last thing we want, is a, is a nuclear war, obviously. And so, uh, uh, you, you rightly, I think, point out, it's, it's not on the same level, but could it be a path to something you know, more destructive? I, I think it could be. And so that's why a company like CrowdStrike and others in the industry are so important for us to defend against those asymmetric attacks. Do you agree? No, I, I think that that's right. I mean, one of the reasons I, I mentioned at the outset here, I've moved into the private sector, but I'm still in the fight, right? We're protecting critical infrastructure around the globe, and you mentioned the big four, who are still the big four, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. Those nations are aligned, right? Russia and China are aligned, Iran and Russia are aligned, right. China and North Korea are aligned. They all have different geopolitical aspirations, they have different objectives, but they all have one common objective, and that is to disrupt the West, because disruption of the West and the U.S. being a big target of the West, you know, Europe, of course, is all part of that, but democracies themselves, um, the U.S. Is, is under fire, but so are our allies. And if we're not aligned, if we're not sharing information, sharing intelligence, to disrupt these types of attacks and building capabilities to counter those types of attacks, then we're missing opportunity because the big four are not constrained by the Constitution, oftentimes the norms of society and yeah. you know, different conventions that have been, been in place for, for decades to keep certain things in check. Well, one way they could, of course, disrupt the West uh, is this year in our elections. So what are, the, what are you seeing, what are your concerns? We already know that the big four are, are targeting with um, misinformation, disinformation, but what are other specific cyber threats that you're seeing, that you're concerned about? So, so there's two components when I think about disrupting the election, and it's a great segue because it goes directly to that point. 
the West itself is in, is in the crosshairs of the big four. And the US is right out in front. They're standing in front of, of, of the West. Um, and our election is going to have significant uh, worldwide and historic consequences, one way or the other, in, in this country. Um, so the two components when I think about disrupting the election, one is um, what people have often been concerned about, which is somebody somehow disrupting voter registration logs or disrupting how votes are counted, somehow changing the actual results of the election electronically. <coughs> Excuse me, and I think that, uh, that at, at scale, with enough to really impact a wide election, is probably much less of a concern because of how disparate our electoral process is, our system is. You know, 50 states and dozens or hundreds of counties within those different states, all with different systems. Um, so not one general system that's targeted. You know, all your eggs in one basket. There might be, and there, we've seen historically, little things that have, have been impactful, but certainly not to the extent that it would change an election. The bigger issue and the bigger concern and the bigger risk, I think, is the use of, of things like AI through social media campaigns to sow um, disruption and chaos and cause people to challenge the election. We saw just this morning the U.S. government come out specifically and say they have seen Russia trying to undermine the Harris campaign. They had been focused on Biden. When Biden pulled out in July, they trained their sights on Harris and there's been that transition period and now they're seeing actual and they've identified specific campaigns. We saw the Trump campaign being targeted by Iran. Again, US government, lots of collection capabilities. I understand how the intelligence process works. Working with allies, there's a lot of visibility into what's happening there. So we've seen this occur. It will absolutely continue up until uh, election day. We will continue to see the use of social media to push information to cause chaos inside the United States of America, and that's incredible. And let me just, one more yeah, point. Please. 2024, 40 different elections globally. Yeah. So we saw, for example, in Taiwan, China trying to undermine the, the Taiwanese president in advance of that election. We are going, we've seen it elsewhere around Europe, in the Middle East, we are going to continue to see this. This is not something just for our election, this is something that is a playbook going forward indefinitely. Do you think, and based on either data or intuition, does the big four, do they care who wins the election or do they just want to collaborate to foment uh, dis, you know, uh, arguments? Because you, one, one could argue, from a foreign policy standpoint, it doesn't really matter who's president. There's, it's the NSA and the CIA and the FBI and others that are experienced at government who are actually you know, calling the shots. And, and, and so do they care? Who wins, or do you think they're just trying to create, you know, uh, dissension? So, in 2008, when I was still in the FBI, it was the first time we saw um, electronic infiltration of campaigns. So we saw the U.S. government, this is public now, it was classified at the time, but the U.S. government um, saw China targeting the McCain and the Obama campaign. And in that case, this was a review of each of the candidates' policies. What's their foreign policy going to be? What's their economic policy going to be? Who are some of the people they're considering for cabinet level positions? It was pure espionage, plain and simple. And espionage, by the way, has been going on for a few thousand years, right? It used to be some guy crawling underneath a tent and getting a piece of papyrus that had some scribbling on it, right? right. But now we've moved to the digital age. This is not espionage anymore. This is about sowing confusion and deceit. So when you talk about the big four, each of them have different objectives. Each of them may have particular candidates that they believe might be supportive of their policies. But I think at, at the highest level, it's about confusion and deceit and causing Americans to be at war with each other, at odds with each other. And I think we've seen the divisiveness. And in my opinion, much of that is through social media. Taking statements that individuals have made, exasperating them, extrapolating, um, 
Um, and that no. happens even without our adversaries getting involved, 100% too. 100% so. it does. But they I amplify. Mean, they're internal yes. adversaries. Yes, right. There are people internally who want to cause decision, d d division, et cetera. And it, I mean, it works against the principles of democracy when people are not able to make uh, rational decisions because the information they have is completely manufactured, it's wrong, it's a complete fabrication, that's, that's a problem. Is there any evidence that suggests that they're collaborating? Like, hey Russia, you take on Harris and Waltz, and, and Iran, you take on Trump and Vance. I haven't seen no. that. Um, anything that I've seen has been um, uh, individual types of campaigns. Yeah. Doesn't mean it hasn't happened or it won't happen, but I haven't seen it. So what do you recommend business leaders do, as well as normal, just everyday citizens do, to, to protect against these threats, or at least to be more aware of them? So, Rebecca, the word you hit on is the word I want everybody to just take and scribble it on their head. It's awareness, and it's about having an appreciation for the media. I've been engaged with the media throughout my professional life. Um, and I am a huge believer in the value of the media being able to shine a light. I worked public corruption for the first 10 years of my career, and I can't tell you how many times a good journalist identified something, some official that was using their office for personal gain and victimizing citizens. And it led to somebody getting arrested and saving citizens. It was the media that shined a light. So I think that as citizens, this awareness level is about knowing where you're getting your information from, checking your sources. Don't just look at a, at a tweet that somebody put out and retweet it or a Facebook post and send it out to all your friends without understanding. Is it valid or not? Is this a legitimate account it came from or is it, is it a, um, a fraudulent account, right? Um, is, validate your sources. Be aware that there are these campaigns ongoing and that as citizens, it's our responsibility to ensure that we are assessing information, ensuring it's valid, before we are becoming part of the process to fan the flames. I can tell you there are a lot of people who have unwittingly helped a lot of foreign governments whose sole objective is to disrupt this country. And that is very, very troubling to me. You think AI will help? I had a really good argument with perplexity this morning. <laughs> I did, I'm All sure, right, we okay. went back and forth. I was debating with perplexity. I said, well, you're, you're missing this. And it would say, yeah, you know, you're right. And it would give me both sides. Do you think that AI can help with that awareness or will it hurt? A AI can help and can hurt. So the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, AI is a huge um, advancement and it enables people, cybersecurity companies. We've been using AI for 10 years. When people think about AI now, they're thinking about generative AI, right? Which is ChatGBT, the ability for the lay person to enter a command into, uh, into a, a search bar and get a result. But we've been using AI for 10 years. To be able to, um, to analyze and evaluate data that might take humans days or weeks, they can do in, in minutes. So in that case, it's usually valuable to sort through a lot of nonsense and say, this is, a, this is true. Conversely, AI and this concept of deep fakes has allowed adversaries to get advantage and lay people to become more sophisticated because they now have the technical skills but they're using the, um, the, the um, large language model, the AI model, to help advance their capability. So it goes both ways. I think overall, it's, it's more helpful for security people at this time. Okay, well I'm going to end on that positive note, even though this conversation has scared the bejesus out of me, but thank you very much, <laughs> Sean Henry. Great to have you on theCUBE. Thanks for having me, I really appreciate You're you. You're welcome. All right. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of Falcon 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.